So um, it's time for our, our, our first keynote of the conference, and it is my pleasure to introduce our next speakers. Um, I've got a great bio here, and I want to do it justice. And um, funny story was I sat down next to Diana and Matua Mark this morning, and I said, you know, what do you really want me to say, and how do you really want me to introduce you? And they said, do whatever you want. Say whatever you want. And then about 30 seconds later, Matua Mark said, what did you say? <laughs> and I was like, oh. and Diana said, say that. Say that. So it's, it, is, um, it is a funny story. And I've, even though I've met you this, um, just for a few minutes this morning, you know, we're whanau. You know, we're cousins. You know, from across the Moana. So I'm going to read a little bit because, you know, it's, it's really important to mention the, just the, the amazing achievements and work that you've done and are doing. So I'm going to start. So in 1990... Diana began her journey in the health industry, training first as a nurse in 2014. She completed her specialist training in psychiatry and is a fellow of the Royal Australia New Zealand College of Psychiatry. In 2010, Diana was awarded the prestigious Nari Muivisi Manakura Award. It is awarded to those who display characteristics of the 28th Māori Battalion strength of character, ambition, courage, and original thought. Diana carried these characteristics to the Tairawhiti in 2014, where she became the first Ngāti Puro psychiatrist. In 2020, Diana was awarded the Dr. Māori Goodwill Award in recognition of her dedication to and work in the mental Māori health, Māori mental health, excuse me. Diana is changing the system by pre-referencing indigenous approaches to Oratanga. As a developer of Mahi Atua, she and her husband, Tohunga Makopua, use Māori creation stories and purakau to transform mental health frameworks, providing an affirmation of our amazing genealogy and validation of our, resili of our resilience. Mark and Diana are teaching communities to practice an alternative to the Western model, using a culturally sensitive new therapy to address mental distress and suffering amongst Māori. Mark. Matua Mark was raised in Mangatuna by his old people and is considered a historian by his East Coast tribes. He is renowned for his expertise as a master carver and spent 44 years in carving, which includes completing several, seven ancestral meeting houses. It's amazing. Mark has dedicated 31 years of working at the forefront of modern moko, which is traditional Māori tattoo, and has trained several moko artists while still continuing to work as a moko artist himself. He first began his journey in mental health services in 2012 as a cultural advisor worker for a community Māori mental health services in Port Royal Wellington. He is a confident facilitator and his approach to healing is celebrated by communities as he embraces his unique skills as a storyteller and keeper of ancient Māori knowledge and whakapapa. He holds the position as tōhuna, which is expert, in the Te Kuwatawata, a groundbreaking Māori design mainstream mental health service. Together with his wife, Dr. Diana Kopua, Mark has created Te Kurahuna, a whare wānganga, where practitioners learn indigenous knowledge in a unique and authentic way. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Diana Kopua and her amazing husband, Tohunga Mark Kopua.
Puh. I give you a name from your ancestors so you may know who you are. I give you a name from your paper heart so you may know where you're from. De de more, de te 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 if ever you lose your way, whisper your name. I give you a name from the tides, so you may know how far you've come. I give you a name for the future So you may know which way to go De pu, de more, de wu, de aka De rea, de wandui, de ti puranga If ever you lose your way スパイネイ。あ、これの。はい。うちらいえけ、カティカホキ、メメヒトヌキでこれはね。とのワイドは、エノホトヌ、イワンガヌイヤタタウ。あなコレロ、ガコレロマナ、エノホトヌ、ハ
you know, because we're so starved of mokopunas. But when we see our mokopunas, even on face, uh, FaceTime, something is ignited in us. And that, that's, that, I know, comes from our purako about the creation of mankind. And in the creation of mankind, one of the tonga that was given by Io Matua Kore uh, to Henea Huone as she was being created, the last part of this was called a Modi. Narerato, oh, sorry, uh, and that Modi was handed down from Io. And it was Tane that breathed life into, into Henea Huone. And the very first thing that Kate was uttered from that was Tihe Modi Ora. And this Modi that was given by Io and implanted by uh, Tane into Hine Ahuone came alive. And it's very much like when I see my Mokopunas, that Modi in me comes alive. And uh, so for, for me, when I go back to uh, my place in uh, Mangatuna, a Modi comes alive inside me. And that's really, really important because it's been Modi throughout our history and uh, the journeying across the oceans, you can imagine that, trying to journey across the Pacific with only the stars, although they were experts, with only the stars, the winds and the fish and all that to guide you on that journey, you're going to need some form of modi in order to keep you focused on the outcome, to keep alive that modi inside you. That's me, that's enough for me, I think. I try to stay in my lane. Uh, so, um, we're used to looking at you with little windows, Zoom windows, so um, a big mihi to those people who are connecting virtually, we're used to you, don't worry about missing out because we're seeing all of these guys as little windows as well. Um, and on the Modi note, what we're, um, we're about to challenge you, you're about to be very challenged, and it's, it's with aroha. Um, and it's really hard to be challenging with aroha when you feel so upset or challenged by what things we might say. So we have a karakia that a tohunga uh, te nohotema uh, uses for his children in a Māori kura in Gisborne. And he makes sure that they realise, every child realises that they are their university everywhere they go. So everywhere we go, we are our own university. And so your body and all that it, it, um, it holds and all that it collects throughout your day is filtering what you value and what you don't value. And so I want you to do this karaki with me. I don't know if I worked on the, I was going to say the Hoover, Hoover, Woover, Hoover app. Woover. <laughs> the Woover. The fova. <laughs> so, um, so I put the karakia words on the app, but I'm not sure if it showed up. But Kate Pai, it goes like this. You just need to parrot us. Kapai? Taku whare wānanga. Taku whare wānanga. Whare tōpito. Te whare tōpito. Ira atua. Ira atu. Whare ngākau. Whare ngākau. Ira wairua. Ira wairua. Whare whatumanua. Whare Fatu Manoa, Ira Tangata, Ira Tangata, Whare Hinengaro, Te Whare Hinengaro, Ira Tipuna, Ira Tipuna, Whare Waha, Te Whare Waha, Ira Fenua, Ira Fenua, Whare Tangata, Whare Tangata, Ira Ariki, Ira Ariki, Taku Whare Wananga, Taku Whare Wananga. So, thank you. That's our karakia. That's our ritual that we can engage in before we come into spaces of learning. And I imagine there's not one person in this room that doesn't want to learn, that doesn't want to improve. But there are many things that will stop you wanting to engage, particularly when it's uncomfortable for you. And one of those times when it's uncomfortable for you is when you disagree. And when you disagree, how the hell do you learn, right? And there's one word that really gets people disagreeing, and that's racism. So there, I said it once. I'm going to say it several times. By now, I'd imagine that many of you have already engaged in this conversation, and many of you have opinions about it. 
but I'm, in, I'm imagining that the percentage of you who have actually engaged in understanding the whakapapa of racism has actually reduced in the percentage. So we all have opinions, or there are some fence sitters, but the whakapapa of racism can go all the way back to the discovery of the Christian discovery, the, the, what? the doctrine. doctrine of Christian discovery. And we're not here to talk to you about that. But we are here to have these challenging conversations with you, which is really hard when it's like that. We talk to you. We're really after a wānanga. And so um, Mark and I are going to try and have a conversation and imagine that we're thinking about some of the things that you um, might be going through and experiencing. So taku whare wānanga is an idea of saying, well, what's whare tōpito? And it is this whare inside our university, our individual university, that if you are engaging with what matters to us, what we are innately connected to, that we value. And put your hands up if you are a grandparent. Time stops, right? It stops, and you watch them, and their innocence, and their beauty, and your heart melts. We value our grandchildren. Immensely. You start showing everybody your photos. <laughs> and the thing is, is if you are engaging in activities that reflect what you value, your spirit flourishes, right? But how many of us, Fano, are engaging in what we value? And although we have big hearts and we care and we want change and we want good outcomes, the statistics tell us that as much as we give, we are getting really bad outcomes. Right? So, Fare Topito, even though we're engaged in work that we love, if we don't like it or someone pisses us off or it's just not changing at the pace we want, we move on. So, we move on because we need our spirit to flourish. So my first challenge to you is if you're pissed off and you're very negative in your approach with everything to do with work, move on, find your happy place. Because transformation requires change at all levels, not just the top, all levels. So we've talked about tōpito and whare ngāko ira wairua. The next one, is engaging in a story for Mark way before Te Aute College, I tell you. It was in Mangatuna, and he was one of those country Māori. You know, they didn't learn to speak Māori, they just spoke Māori. And whereas I was very much an urban Māori and learnt Māori in my adult years, but there were these urban cousins of Mark's, and one of them was called Bruce. And Bruce would come up to Mangatuna where Mark didn't have many little toys, but he had a yellow truck. And Bruce wanted to play with it. You know, the urban Māori that has everything, they have lots of toys, but he wanted to play with the yellow truck. And regardless of the fact that they are both in their 60s now, he still can't get over the fact <laughs> that Bruce made your nanny, his mum, growl him and force him to share the blue truck or the yellow truck with Bruce. Can't get over it. Right? Oh, I love the kids. <laughs> Out of 10, how distressing is that for you? Ooh. 10 being now the most distressing. Now that you bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> Do you all have those relationships with people in the family, with your colleagues? We're pissed, right? We're pissed with the ministry for not funding us. We're pissed with the new team leaders and their new ideas. We're pissed at so much. We think we're right. In fact, there's evidence that shows that the helping profession thinks that each one of us is 80% more right than everyone else. <laughs> Whare Whatu Manua is this... Actually, I think we should change our tack and we should talk about Bruce near the end of our presentation because <laughs> I'm going to struggle to get past it now. <laughs> and that's the truth of it. Whare Fatu Manua, and it was in one of the songs before it referred to as soul, but we like to see it as our 
intimate relationships with each other as human beings. And we struggle sometimes to relate to people who have different beliefs and different ideas and different faiths and different education backgrounds. We struggle with each other. So how do we reconcile that in our university? So someone comes in and teaches me, but I remember that they stole my earrings when we were five, and the knowledge is really valuable, but I can't get over the stolen earrings, right? That's one of the biggest issues that we have in Aotearoa. So we come up to whare hiningaro ira tipuna, and this is the way we think. We have to remember, and I want you, I want to challenge you, every single presentation that you will go to in the next few days has come from a place where knowledge is made and knowledge is held and knowledge is disseminated and now you are of that knowledge. How did you learn to believe the things that you have come to know? Given that our society is premised hugely on racism, but none of us are the vultures that we think racists are. Racism after the civil rights movement actually morphed into something much more insidious. Our whole country's institutions are founded on racist ideology, and none of us had anything to do with that. Right? We've all grown up. Our, front, our collective frontal lobe has grown up. We accept that women have the right to vote. <laughs> well done. We accept that women can marry and be intimately in love with women, and that men can intimately be connected and in love with and marry their male partner. In fact, we accept that if you have a penis and you don't want to be a he, kai te pai tēna. We have morphed into something so mature, but we still cannot sit in a room and disagree and stay in the room and disagree and know that we might leave the room not agreeing. My challenge to you is that the conversation about racism must happen at your dining room table. We must sit with each other. When we go in, know that it will be uncomfortable. Accept that you will feel that discomfort, that you will probably disagree, and that when you leave, you might not agree. If we disagree and find different pockets of the world to exist and not come together, we will not be able to move on. Does anyone in the room disagree with that? I'm keen for a disagreement. Kapai. Our whare wānanga is so important. What are the, I'm not asking you to change. I'm asking you to recognize your positionality in society right now. Because the health system is not responsible alone for racism. And the justice system is not responsible alone for racism. The education system is not responsible alone for racism. We are. I perpetuate racism on the daily. Good. Does that surprise anyone? It is quite a liberating statement to say, I am a psychiatrist. I was tra trained under a racist curriculum that privileged white philosophers at a time when racism was rife. Injustices were rife. And we still speak that language, which brings me down to whare waha. What we speak, we grow. And today we're going to challenge you because te kurahuna, our small little whare wānanga, we believe that the current diagnostic classification system, the diagnostic statistical manual, is actually damaging our people. 
in fact, we think is damaging everyone. And all of the designs and the developments and institutions are founded upon these systems of knowledge. What we speak, we grow. What are we speaking? Do you know where those phrases, those cliches, where they came from? Do you agree with the person that brought them into existence, the knowledge maker, the knowledge disseminator? Universities are racist, what do you call it, AF. <laughs> I've grown. Last time I was in Auckland, they didn't like me swearing, so um, I've just got a little... Yeah, I've seen the improvements. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so what we speak, we grow, because whānau, Fare tangata ira ariki, we are amazing. Each and every one of you, of us, is amazing. But we are perpetuating racism, and in our amazingness, we can find a path to address the real issue in Aotearoa, and that's racism. And my concern in these conferences is that we are more likely to spend millions of dollars researching the unknown substrates in the brain that make us more likely to be addicts, to make us more likely to be deeply depressed. But I ask you this, if I took your house away from you, if I took your land away from you, if I took your language away from you, what else is there to do but to disappear and enjoy a sort of mundane nothing activity. I told you I would be challenging. I hope that, that this is the whare wānanga. What are the things that are shutting up your shop as you're listening? I ask you to recognise what's going on for you, your visceral response to what I'm saying. And I want you to allow the words and the messages to just be and I want you to start investigating why you're feeling this way. What's your Bruce? What's the yellow truck? What's getting in the way of you being able to sit in this and explore your responses? Because your fatu manawa, your emotional, deep connected fatu manawa responses, are getting in the way of us collectively progressing in Aotearoa. I want to share what sometimes gets in the way for me is that the, the stories that I have learned over the years and the whakapapa that goes with those stories, because I have used them in all my careers to build houses and to do moko, and um, that, that grouping of knowledge is considered myth. And that hurts me deeply because... Um, because it is these knowledge makers from a whole nother uh, ideological uh, atmosphere <laughs> that has deemed what I know as myth and legend. And uh, I, I just think about at the moment we're, we're putting together a reprogramming uh, course for nurses and the whakapapa that Māori have that has been pushed to the side because it's been considered mumbo-jumbo and humbug, the whakapapa that we have about nursing and about health is so deep and broad and encompassing um, that it, it, it peeves me off that it's considered a myth because it can actually add, I think, in my opinion, add value to the understanding of how we care for people, whether they're in addictions, whether they're suffering from whatever distress that they're suffering from, that this whakapapa can actually help them. Uh, so it's just a matter of allowing it to have a, a primary space in the world of well-being in, in that space. So it's, it's part of me with this whole racist corridor that Diana is delivering is that that's an example of a whole body of knowledge not being allowed access because it's considered myth. And we accept that. We, you know, our society is, in general has accepted that. I like that. I, I, you might not have been, but you look really emotionally impacted by that. In today's society, 
our Western knowledge system determines who the heroes are and who the villains are. So let me tell you a story about Dr. Dai, the villain. <laughs> I was the, um, so yeah, so early 90s uh, psychiatric nurse, only ever worked in a kaupapa Māori service, Māori approaches, and we thought we were cool, uh, using Māori knowledge. But every time the practitioner got a little bit anxious about not being helpful, their eyes would stare toward the psychiatrist in the room. And I didn't like that. I was a feisty young Māori nurse, I think Ngāti Tō influenced my whakapapa, my Ngāti Pūrau whakapapa. I went to med school to gain power to grow mahi atua. I said it, but I didn't know it would uh, morph into what it's become now. And so mahi atua, uh, became uh, something that grew into uh, more than I could have ever imagined, but it was the power that I held as a medical doctor and then training to be a psychiatrist, which I knew before I started the journey that I wanted to be a psychiatrist. So after 10 plus years of being a nurse, 13 years later, I'm back in the health system, growing mahi atua. I knew I was going to go back to where my whakapapa comes from, the tairawhiti, and I became the head of department for psychiatry for the DHB, tairawhiti DHB. It was at a time when the parenting and pregnancy pilot in, Wai, in Auckland, Waite Mata, had been going for a few years, and they decided that they would go to the hard-to-reach areas, and the Tairawhiti was one of them. And we sat in a meeting, and I was the head of department. It holds a lot of mana. And I wasn't at all impressed with the languaging of hard-to-reach, and I'm not sure, and if you look at the literature, so this is my, open up your door, still whare wānanga, Richard, the, um, the idea of stigma stopping our people from accessing services when they help, that hasn't proven to be successful. Million do millions of dollars have been spent on anti-stigma campaigns. They haven't, uh, haven't increased access for Indigenous peoples across the world. In fact, even increasing, and I was saying this to PT before, increasing Indigenous people in our workforce doesn't increase access either. A brown face replicating what was in a Western system is not increasing access. Let me say it another way. I don't think I did well. And that's the thing about mahi where we get to take two. So... Um, a Māori with a big heart gets trained under a racist training curriculum. And what I be, mean by racist is that Western knowledge, the dominant culture, those ideas are what we have to learn to get a tohu to help our people. They're not going in this direction. They are not getting a tohu by our standards so that they can go and have an impactful difference at that torpedo level. So when they came, the Parenting and Pregnancy Service, which is for hapu mamas, pregnant mamas, <coughs> for all for children up to the age of two and their families, when they came to the tairawhiti, I forged mahi atua into that kaupapa. It became to heading a matua. All of the iwi of the tairawhiti governed this organisation and Ngāti Pūrau Hauora became the contract holder and mahi atua was a kaupapa. And to mahi atua is a kaupapa that trains you to be a mataora, a change agent. Uh, 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 the other Māori word for mataora, well, you tell. You, you tell the other words for mataora. This is your, I'm in your lane now. Backing out. Beep, beep, beep. Well, what? Mataora. I see, he doesn't even know what I'm saying. Like, mataora, the definition oh, for mataora. the mat definition yes. of mataora. <laughs> Husband and wife. Does this happen to you, ladies? So the definition of a mataora, this is a mataora as well. This full facial moko for a male is a mataora. But it comes about from an, uh, one of our ancestors, a tipuna, that we consider to be the very first change agent. He was a mongrel of a fella. And he, for the love for his wife, he journeyed and 
expose himself to all the vulnerabilities of being out of his comfort space in order to get that wife back. And as a result of that, he not only changed his attitude, uh, all those sorts of things, but he received a moko, which was the first time. He, he learned how to, how to apply moko and so forth. And over the period of time that he was uh, in this other environment, uh, a, a peaceful environment, he took on board that peaceful attitude. And uh, when he was, it was time for him to return with his wife, um, he made a pledge that not only would he take back the moko, the, the skills of being a moko artist, but he would also take back uh, the skills and that wairua, that modi of being a good person, and that he would etch that permanently into his people. Uh, so he was considered by us as uh, the very first uh, change agent. But not only that, his wife had a whakapapa that came down uh, from a number of different... Uh, from a, a wahine who was a sister to Tangaro Atua of the sea and so forth, but also she was a, a child that came out of the forest and her name was Hinutohu. And Hinutohu is a personification, I don't know whether the person, personification is the right word, but she represented the, the saps and the healing uh, uh, fluids that come out of uh, flora and fauna. And so this woman, the wife, inherited that knowledge and skill, and she became recognized as one of our very first nurses uh, because of that skill, to be able to heal. And she actually healed uh, all the, the ailments that he went through mm. uh, to gain his matora, which carried his name. So we do this training, and we make everyone a matora, a change agent. And what we're trying to focus on is not the hard-to-reach Fano but the need for us to change as practitioners. And so we, we also needed to make sure that, um, I'm not sure if you understand about um, the, the effort that we put in to addressing patient and population factors when we're looking at equal treatment. We spend a lot of time, and I heard um, earlier this morning, thoughts about things that stop people from engaging. That's one of three factors if you want equal treatment. We don't do a lot of the second and the third. And the second, like we do a lot of the first. You know, people being able to get babysitters to attend their appointment. Can they afford it? Are they living out country? We can rattle off that big time. But the other two factors important for equal treatment is the practitioner factors and the systemic factors. <coughs> So us who are practitioners in the room, what are the factors that we contribute to unequal treatment? What are the things that we do on the basis of this racist corridor that I just talked about? We're trained with a tohu. We already know meritocracy um, in New Zealand, uh, if you, uh, you promise that if you go to university, if you work hard, you're guaranteed a job. That's not that's a myth in New Zealand for Māori. We're less likely to achieve an education. Then we go to university, we're more likely to pull out of university. It doesn't reflect our culture. And the knowledge that we have to learn to get a tohu doesn't resonate with us at a topito level to help our people. And then when we do get into a job, it's a sick system with a whole bunch of ideas pushed by leaders that aren't allowing our knowledge to grow. So we trained them to be mata with that in mind. As a mata you have to get feedback from the whānau that come in. You have to ask them, I'm trying to express empathy, did you receive it? And all of the indigenous knowledge is great, but that's not the only thing. Because Mahi Atua has a principle of tēnei te pō no mai te ao, indigenize the space that you occupy. But the second principle is ka mā te ariki, ka mā te tawira. And that is that we have to have the utmost critical lens on our behaviour. Every time a whānau comes in, they are the ariki, you are the student. 
what is it that I need to change to tailor make this service for you? And we are not speaking like that. At a, and at a systemic level, regarding <coughs> systemic racism, there is so much that we need to change. And I've been involved with the Māori Health Authority. The problem with the Māori Health Authority as it exists now is that the Ministry of Health, bless you, Richard, the Ministry of Health <laughs> is the steward for the Māori Health Authority. When is the Māori Health Authority going to be independent other than under a Māori constitution? These are conversations that Moana Jackson and many like him have been having for years. And many of you will see that as apartheid. But how many of you, in your efforts with all of your might, are seeing poor outcomes even though we resource more and more money into the services that you want. Many of you will think we need more money, we need more people, we need more organisations. And the primary mental health and addiction model had no evidence for Māori. It came from Oregon. It was from a close relationship with a minister and was rolled <coughs> out. Te ku watawata, which followed Te Hiringa Matua in Gisborne, was mahiatua driven. And here's some statistics. We reduced coercive care by 33%. We reduced inpatient youth admissions by 56% for Māori. We reduced the need for children and youth to go into the secondary service. We had caseloads in the 30s and 40s, went down to 12% because at the front door was a Māori kaupapa trying hard to look at our contribution to the problem and always responding to feedback. Our statistics were phenomenal. Guess how much funding our kaupapa got? And I'm talking about the workforce kaupapa, training mataora. That's how much. And now, Rihanna Manuel, the CE of the Māori Health Authority, she scouted us when we left the DHB, the system. We went to the Coromandel. We went to the Hauraki, the Coromandel Peninsula. Beautiful and if you, place. Beautiful place. If you go there, if you ring 0508 111 you will get a mahi atua kaupapa. They invested heavily in te kurahuna. If you go to Ruapotaka, Papakura Marae, Te Hononga, Kōkiri, Trust, Raungaiti and Te Waharoa, and you ring 0800 Mahi A Atua, you will get a Mahi Atua Mataora response. And yet still, no one has knocked on the door of Te Kurahuna. Just, we already had this conversation. But this is an example of racism. When we talk about workforce, what are we talking about? Who's governing the country and making the decisions about increasing the workforce to transform the health system? We're not engaged in that conversation, and there is no other workforce provider like us. We are Indigenous AF. I'm imagining by now there are at least a third of the room who are uncomfortable. I ask you, please, check it out. Where is it coming from? If you have a challenging question for us, please ask it. Put it out there. It could be biased. It could be absolutely um, negatively biased against us. But out is good. We need to know how we're all thinking I'm telling you about how Dr. Dai became a villain from getting the outcomes that we all are after. Without the money. It's time to become villains. I'd really like to engage in a conversation. So what I'm going to do is put two minutes on hold because keynotes aren't really keynotes for us. We want to wānanga. Turn to the person next to you. What's going on for you? What did I say that you disagree with or that makes you feel uncomfortable? Or what are you surprised by? Or what do you want to know more of? Like, develop a question. 
and bring it to us because we don't want to waste your time. Kapai, we'll give you two minutes. Kill everyone. If you can just package up your partai, your question, in a little treasure box in your imagination for now, and listen to the Pūrāko and wonder about your position in this story, share your question on the app, and let's have a conversation. Kāpai, sir. This, this story, I'll try and make it as brief as I can, but this story is about being stuck and getting unstuck. So in the beginning, Rangi Nui, Sky Father, and Papa Tūnuku, uh, Earth Mother, uh, had a relationship and fell deeply in love with each other and decided they'd never ever part ever again. That came with a, with a number of different outcomes, and those were called children. <laughs> now, as more and more children they had, uh, because these two wouldn't let each other go, these children started to fill this little void space until it was no longer void. But it became increasingly more and more uncomfortable for those children. It was one minute it was cold, next minute it was hot. Uh, one minute there was no smells, next minute there were smells everywhere. Uh, one minute it was, uh, it was very uncomfortable and, uh, and it was just restricting. Now... In our Māori language, there's a, a sentence that says, I noho tata pū ngā atua, which means that our uh, atua, these are all these children, our atua existed in a close, touching cluster. But inside those Māori words, there's a word that comes out of it that is, that is the word tapu. I noho tata pū ngā atua. I noho tapu ngā atua. So, this is the beginning, or a whakapapa for the word tapu, which we understand as being sacred and all that. But in this particular story, because this is where this interpretation comes from, the word tapu means con restricted, confined, uncomfortable, all those types of challenging, challenging words. So when we talk about things that are uncomfortable, oh, he tapu te kōrero. It's very, very uncomfortable to talk about those things. Like racism, oh, he kupu tapu te. Right, so this is where that word comes from. So go back to the kids. They're all sitting in there, getting increasingly angry with each other and uncomfortable, and nobody's doing anything about it. Then after after a zillion years, one of them called Kekerewai, which means to stir the water, says in the darkness, "I'm sick of this." <coughs> now, in that darkness, Kekerewai couldn't be heard. So Kekerewai decided to speak to the atua, to the sibling right next door to Kekerewai called Toroi Waho. And Toroi Waho means to spread out. So perfect person to, the gossiper, perfect, perfect atua to speak to. The message of I'm over this, we need change and so forth was distributed out to all of them by Toroi Waho. Eventually, 
this corridor, this uh, discussion goes round and round and round with no outcome, but the only outcome that it does is that it forms two houses of, of belief and understanding. One house is called Tūtianiwaniwa, which is predominantly all the older Atua, and who are quite comfortable and happy with the status quo, with the way things are, and change is not needed. And the other house, which was called Huakipodi, uh, was the house of predominantly the younger Atua that wanted change now, right? And so they couldn't come to a, an agreement at any point in time, and so this corridor went round and round and round. And in the meantime, in all that darkness, one of these other Atua, a younger one, called Uepoto, short people, <laughs> spotted in all this darkness this tiny little glimmer. It was the strangest thing in darkness. And this glimmer came from the phosphorus bum of a glowworm. And if you've ever seen a glowworm, it's like, what's that thing? It's a little bit less than as brighter than those. And, and eventually, the longer you look at it, you think, oh, that's a glowworm. Right. So this is where this light came from. It was called a hinātore. Some call it iPhone. <laughs> but it was called the hinātore, which is the phosphorus glow. And now the hinātore is a word that we can use to, to mean potential. In Uepoto, this atua became known as the atua of curiosity. And so Uepoto became magnetized by this tiny little light and decided to share this uh, revelation with one of the other siblings around, which was called Te Mamaru. Te Mamaru means the white shelter, and also uh, Te Mamaru, that atua became a potiriao or a director, a general manager for all the clouds. And so now they're having this discussion about this tiny little light, and they're both curious about it. And so they decide, well, let's go and explore even further. But we're going to take this other sibling with us called Pekatua. And Pekatua became, is known as the origin of all the centipedes, the, the, the wedding. And so away they go. And because this is taking them away from this conversation over there, one of their tuakana, who goes by the name of Firo, Firo Te Tipua. Firo is the atua of darkness, the atua of fear, the atua of disease. And Firo doesn't like the fact that these three have pulled away from the conversation. And so Firo bellows out in all the darkness, instilling fear into them, and says, cut it out. Here's the conversation over here. But these three have been fully magnetized by the curiosity of this hinātore light that's in the darkness, and they ignore him. I'm not supposed to say him. They ignore Firo and keep moving. So Firo ups the ante and says, right, if you don't listen to me and my, my ways and my, my instructions or my uh, control, I'm going to curse you. And so they, they just ignore it. It's another threat that they just ignore and keep moving towards the Hinātore. So Firo throws the first curse out, and it is the curse that we have inherited called goosebumps. And every time we experience cold, which Firo is the one of the atua of, or we experience fear from the darkness or fear, we will also experience physically goosebumps. And so that's something that we've inherited and it was first thrown on Uepoto short group, the short people. But it's just goosebumps. So they decide, nah, let's just keep moving towards this inatore. So they keep moving. Firo then turns up the volume and he reaches out to grab a hold of Tamamaru, could only grab the hair and rip Tamamaru's hair out and unfortunately threw it up into the sky, which is why Tamamaru, who's up there in the clouds looking for the poor bugger's hair. And that's the reason, uh, Tanima, that we ha are uh, cursed with, with uh, getting, I can see a few of you in here, you can't hide, we are cursed with premature balding. Because of this curse, but it's only balding. We have nothing to worry about. If you look at some of the your brunners of the of the world, they're they're very handsome. So these three keep moving towards the Hinātore, forgetting that you know, let's not worry about balding and goosebumps. Let's just keep moving forward. <laughs> and so as they move forward, what Firo then does, pulls out a weapon, his weapon, and takes a swing at uh, Peketua, and Peketua hits the dust, scuttles in underneath the rock, and henceforth, from that day forward, we have Wedi or, or centipedes, also known as Peketua. Now, because of this, 
they, this, this is nothing. They just keep moving towards the Hinatori, and because of their fear of disciples, well, okay, you fellows are not going to listen to uh, heed my instructions. I'm going to uh, have to extinguish that little light that you're so fascinated by. And just before Firo turns to go and extinguish the Hinatore, all the other Atu have stopped their discussion and they're watching what's the proceedings, what's going on, and they decide, Tane then decides to step in. And Tane says to, to the older uh, sibling, um, Firo, I can see that you ha- uh, hold fear for, even for that light. Not only are you the Atu of fear, but you hold fear for that light. And you say that you want to extinguish that, that light, but I do know that the only way that you can extinguish that light is to flood it in absolute daylight. And, of course, we know that with a glowworm, as soon as the light appears, the sun appears, the glowworm switches its bum off, and we can't see it anymore. So that's the first story. It's considered uh, the Battle of Wits, and the very first battle between our Atua, and it was a battle about, or it was a story about finding your critical mass and finding a way out of stuck situations. So Kekerewai was uh, the first, so there's a whole bunch of rituals in the story, and we talked about systemic factors that contribute to equal treatment, is our knowledge system must flourish. It's more than just Māori in a service. Our education system does not promote um, our, our mātauranga Māori. We, we are a society, although we do as individuals and families do, that the structure of the institution is perpetuating a dominant knowledge system. So all of the rituals in the story, we've packaged into te kūwatawata design. So kia kere wai is to make sure we speak up. We make sure that we prioritise the whānau voice to be able to speak up. And when I'm working with a colleague, I speak up if I see something that looked a little bit biased or negative toward the whānau, so that we can learn. I'm sharing that to learn, not to just have it out with each other. So speaking up, kia kere wai. Torui waho, sharing the information. We have acts and legislation, the Privacy Act. We have confidentiality that stops us from being able to work as a collective. So a lot of us are performing inside four walls, which is a little bit different than a singer who actually has to perform and you decide whether you like it and we can critique it. We're not being critiqued because we are inside four walls and the Privacy Act and confidentiality stops us from being able to critique that professional. If we could critique a psychiatrist, the whole of New Zealand could critique one person's practice by a video real time, which will never be allowed. We will see some of the things that could change very simply. Habai torui waho, you share the, per- the problem, and then the next ritual was wānanga, the problem went to everyone. Racism is all of our problem. We must engage in the conversation. There's no one person that will have the answer to this problem. All of us have that answer, and that's the wānanga ritual. And then uepoto, the curiosity, the curiosity is what we need. It, we try really hard to be curious when we're pissed off about the yellow truck, but we can't. It's like, what are you doing that for? Is not curiosity. It's like almost like, what are you doing that for? That's wrong, right? Curiosity is this criticality. If you're not sure about criticality, have a look at some of the literature. Criticality is more than critiquing skills and knowledge at a self level. It's about transforming all of us. Criticality, uepoto, curious about the potential, never seeking that curious, that hinātore on their own, went with a collective. You go as a collective. And in this story, mākutu. Makutu, this is the first makutu ever, and you will be stung. Dr. Dai was stung left, right, and center. Can you see all the knives in my back? You will be stung by fetal. So much so that it can be turned around to make me look like fetal. Right? So, regardless, the collective carries on toward the potential, and Tane comes in and says, I can see that you're scared, because I can see fear when we set up our indigenous ways of knowing, our indigenous ways of operating. And what happens when you are fearful 
is that you become fido, and fido is not a negative atua. Fido is the protector of a sacred realm. And so I bring it back to you and your whare wānanga, your university. Do you really need to protect your sacred realm? And how do we open up and engage together in this uncomfortable, what's the Māori word? He noa noa, goosebump activity, vulnerable balding, squashed and made to feel little and scurry away because that's what's happening to us. How do we reach collectively to the hina tore regardless of the discomfort? I believe we can do it. If you're interested in more training, uh, mahiatua.com, go on there. We have matawara training, we have niwareka training. We use indigenous knowledge to start conceptualizing an indigenous ideology while holding on to everything we believe. Right? We talk about many of our atua, many Māori thought that's tapu to talk about our atua. Man, if we make everything tapu, we're going to strangle it into extinction. Kapai. So what we actually need is to be able to be together and indigenize the space that we occupy to be able to critique ourselves with a critical lens collect collectively and engage in hongi hongi te whaiwhaia, our third principle of learning how to give and receive feedback so that we can grow our collective potential. Sure. Um, I think we're finished. Yes. Thank you for having us. I look forward to your questions. That is awesome. Um, on behalf of uh, our whānau here, we'd like to present you a small koha um, in thanking you both for the amazing kōrero this morning. Um, the challenge, the inspiration, and the reminder of who we are in this space. Um, definitely, um, it's amazing. So thank you very much again, Dr. Dai and Matua Mark. Mālo Fafatai.